Well, it's got to mean something. Does it mean that I'm mastering the technology? Does it mean that the technology is improving? Does it mean that the technology is getting easier to use? Maybe it's all of the above. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a better prepared guy. But here it is, kids, for all intents and purposes. 7 o'clock p.m. on the nose. And it's me, Malcolm Tent, coming to you live for this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. And look at that! I can see on the big old monitor screen of mine that looks like I'm actually kind of well framed and in focus and yeah, on time for the first time since I got this fancy schmancy newfangled camera. Which I must admit, in terms of sheer picture quality and sound quality, is the best I've ever had. But the, the learning curve, you know. I'm an old codger, man. I'm 58 years old. I don't like learning curves. I like things to be easy and peasy. But I got to admit, now that I'm starting to get a grip on it, I'm a happy guy. Hello, Mike from Vancouver, tuning in. First one to say hello on Tent Talks Tunes. Mike, you were just down under and it was warm and sunny and summery there, wasn't it? And now you're back here in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's cold and wintry. I got nothing against that. I love the seasons, as you folks may or may not know. I'm a Florida boy originally. Lived in Florida for the first 22 years of my life, where it's sunny and runny all year round. And I actually got to be very loathsome towards that. I love living in Connecticut, <clears throat> excuse me, because Connecticut's got seasons. You've got a definite spring, you've got a summer, you've got a fall, you've got a winter. And I love the changes of the seasons. And even in the middle of winter, and we've only just begun, even in the middle of the winter when you have days like the ones that we just had, where it's single-digit air temperatures and double-digit below zero wind chill factors, I like it. I like the extremity of it. I like the fact that it's something that's completely different from summer where, you know, just like everybody else, we get 90s and we get 100s and we get hot, humid days. And I don't even mind those because they're different from the 10 below zero days. And then in the middle, you've got beautiful springtime and you've got beautiful autumn time with the changing of the leaves and the sprouts and the buds. It's nice. I like it. So, yes, welcome back, Mike, to the land of the cold, frozen winter. Maybe you can tell us what the weather is like there in Vancouver, B.C. Right now, in Connecticut, we had temperatures in the upper 30s, and it was sunny. So it was a really, really nice day we had today. I was actually able to take my daily run and wear short sleeves and short trousers and soak up whatever sunshine there was to soak up. Felt good. Let's hoist our jug of Danbury tap in a toast to the weather. We like the weather. I kind of like my fancy new jug. It's not quite a gallon, but uh, it's got a firm grip handle on it. Mm -mm -mm. Love it. Keeps me well hydrated. So y'all might have wondered, what was this thing that I was waving around in front of the camera? For my intro piece, this is an actual reel-to-reel -reel tape by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. As you can see by the logo on the bottom corner there, it's on my label, TPOS. Wait, where is it? There it is, TPOS. My label. Yes, I do release reel-to-reel -reel tapes on TPOS. I love formats. I love weird, arcane so-called archaic formats. They are an awful lot of fun. And uh, every day I get down on my knees and point myself towards Mecca and thank Allah for King Gizzard and the Wizard Lizard for having these open source free uh, audio materials that they let guys like me release however we see fit. 
So I've got reel to reels, I've got eight tracks, I got cassettes, I've got hand laid seven inch records. And I'm toying with the idea of doing a full length LP, of compiling a bunch of these recordings that they've made available and making my own unique King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard LP that I can take around to the record stores, <clears throat> excuse me, and sell by mail order on Discogs, Bandcamp, eBay, etc., etc., etc. So, and that definitely relates to what I'm going to talk about today besides it being a commercial endeavor. Um, but we'll get to that in just one hot second. Let's see who's tuning in right now. There we got Murray Gelman from Tucson, Arizona. We got Mr. Stephen Young. And Mr. Young, I am sorry. I always think that you're from Richmond, VA. Am I wrong about that? Am I thinking of somebody else? You got to remind me again where you're from because I got a memory that's kind of like the proverbial sieve, you know, information goes in one temple and right out the other, and then radiate throughout the universe everywhere except in my brain where I can actually use it. So, refresh an old man's memory, please. But uh, wherever you are, thanks for tuning in. Regular listener, regular viewer, Mr. Young. Um, so yeah, wait, there you are. Wichita, Kansas. I don't think I ever knew that. So who do I know in Richmond? I don't know. I know somebody in Richmond who I would swear was Stephen Young or Stephen Young. I don't know. I don't know nothing. I'm just proving it over and over again. I don't know nothing. But I'm glad you're on board, man. Shit. So yeah, we're going to talk about my incredible internet audio exhumations. But as you know, first, we'd like to check the calendar and the bulletin board and the mailbox. Um, not a whole lot on the bulletin board or the calendar for the time being. Um, I've got a solo gig coming up on January 15th right here in Connecticut. And once I get all the details about that, I will share them with you, the educated musical consumer. And then we've got a whole year's worth of stuff happening with the almighty anti-scene as we celebrate our 40th year as a band. I say our, even though I've only been in the band for coming up on four years now, but I've been friends with the boys since almost the very beginning, and I feel like I'm a part of the story, and so I can say we, you know, so we are having our 40th anniversary as a band next year, and that's going to include a new album, a new 40th anniversary gig only, full-length LP, and road dates. We want to hit the road and hit it hard and play in a town maybe near you, unless you live in the Southeast. We're totally limiting our Southeastern dates in an effort to run up towards the 40th anniversary show, which is going to be in Spartanburg, South Carolina on September 30th, 2023. The date has been held. There are hotel rooms available. We've got the opening back, the opening bands lined up. It's going to be a big one. So mark your calendars. So then that's the calendar. That's the bulletin board, basically. Let's check the mailbox. It's been a real good week for mail here for Old Man Tent. Oh boy, I'm a happy camper mother fudge sickle eater, dude. So yeah, I just showed you um, the King Gizzard and the Wizard Lizard reel to reel tape. And that definitely ties into something that I got. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I just love formats. And I love blank media. I always have, you know, ever since my father brought home one of the first, like, really good consumer grade cassette recorders that you could hook up, hook up to your stereo and record stuff off the radio and records and stuff like that. I was hooked with the idea. And going back, <clears throat> excuse me, years and years and years to Christmas has passed, once we had that thing, I would, every year for Christmas, for birthdays, whatever, I would always ask for blank tapes because I loved making things with these blank tapes. I loved recording the stuff off the radios, you know, all, you know, like live concerts were always a staple of FM radio. So if there was ever a live concert I was even remotely interested in, I, I would want to tape it off the radio. I taped bands like The Pretenders and The Romantics and, 
you know, whoever was on King Biscuit Flower Hour, like the bus boys and the police. And I mean, just anybody. I had a big old archive of live cassettes I taped off the radio. And that's why I loved getting blank tapes. And so now that I've got the label, T-P-O-S, on Discogs, Bandcamp, etc., I really live for blank media. And um, once I got into making reel-to-reel -reel tapes, I've been fiendish for acquiring blank reels. So I'm, all, I'm on the prowl all the time, usually on the dreaded eBay, looking for people selling lots of blank reel tape. And I recently scored a big old lot of Ampex 1800-foot reels. And my experience is showing that Ampex is a real good brand for reel-to-reel uh, -reel blank tape. I found that Scotch is quite iffy. I found that Memorex is pretty iffy. Um, BASF is pretty good. And so far, Ampex is pretty good. So the more of these I get, the more of these I'm able to make. And that makes me happy. Speaking of making me happy, I see that Chad Cochran is tuned in. Welcome, Chad. Good to have you on board. What else did we get in the mail? Oh, we got stickers. Look at this. Anybody who mail orders from me via either Discogs, which is my preferred platform, or eBay, or Bandcamp. You know, in the good old days of mail order with physical media, you can almost always expect to get lots of bonus goodies, including really cool things like stickers. I got a couple of rolls of stickers in the mail from Mr. Jeffrey K. Clayton himself. And so I love peeling off some of these and dropping them in the box along with flyers and whatever else I got laying around. I'm particularly happy with this one. I actually, this is one of my designs. You know, anti-scene are, as I've said many a time, a, an idea factory. And I was watching an old VHS tape, if you want to talk about our, you know, archaic media, an old VHS tape of Planet of the Apes TV shows that was given to me by our drummer, Sir Barry Hannibal. And, you know, if you're going to spend any time with anti-scene, whether at a gig or in a tour van or, you know, over a plate of uh, French fries, it is almost inevitable that at some point, conversation is going to turn either to Kiss, Star Wars, or Planet of the Apes. You can just about bet money on that. So I was watching this videotape of old Planet of the Apes TV shows, which were actually pretty good. And I hit the pause button, you know, where there was a commercial break on the tape so I could go, you know, grab a snack. And I came back and I found that the, the logo for, plan, for the Planet of the Apes TV show, which is the four apes on horseback, was frozen on the screen. And I said, whoa, look at that. It's one of those things that just kind of flashed, you know. So I took a quick photo of it with my camera and put it in my graphics program, stuck an anti-scene logo on it, sent it over to Jeff Clayton, and he gave it the thumbs up. And now... It exists in physical media. Love it. Love it. So yeah, stickers. I'll send you stickers. Write to me. Order something. Or send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. Stamped address... Uh, what? Self-addressed stamped envelope to Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. And I'll send you some stickers. How's that for an offer? You don't even got to pay nothing. They're free. Just send me a self-addressed stamped envelope to this address right here i can give you a visual on this one i can totally do it there it is in case you hadn't seen it enough already p.o box 3626 newtown connecticut 06470 don't forget it and this is from now who is agp oh avant gore avant gore productions yes Got a mysterious box in the mail from Avant Gord Productions from Indianapolis, Indiana. And it is what appears to be a good old fashioned compilation cassette on this guy's label. And I haven't cracked this open yet. I'm very excited to check this out. I love this kind of stuff. Let's see what's on Avant Gore. You can see the guy's got a definite graphic sensibility. Uh, let's see here. 
DIY label since 2015, focusing on extreme music and movies. Contact for distro list. I'm already in favor of it. And what do we got here? Handwritten note, which I will read at my leisure. And I will also peruse this tape at my leisure. I really don't have any leisure, but you know, I'll make time for media. So thank you, Avant Gore Productions. Bigarza. Thank you for sending me that. And I saw a note in there. I just saw mentioned on the note my solo noise project, Fried Man. So I can tell this guy's got good taste. I just might have to send this dude a Fried Man cassette in return. And some stickers, of course. Also got a box from my old pal Jeff Berman from a really cool band called Divided Heaven. Divided Heaven are a band that I ended up sharing the stage with in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I guess around 2018, maybe 2019, we played a really good show together at a venue called Zephyr. I liked what they did. They liked what I did. We stayed in touch. I had the pleasure of booking Divided Heaven at my favorite event, my favorite all over 21 venue in Connecticut, which is Cafe Nine. We played a really good show together. And then when I played in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a couple of months ago, Jeff showed up at the gig because he lives there. And it, it's cool. We stayed in touch, and now he's got a brand new Divided Heaven album. It's on CD. I have not heard it yet, but I got one in my car, and I've got the album here at home, and he sent me like three albums and four or five CDs. So thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate that. And I hope we get to share the stage again sooner than later. Because every time that we have done so, it's been a groove. Speaking of groove, look at the vinyl on this thing. Ooh. Now that's what I call vinyl, baby. Vinyl, vinyl, vinyl. God, it looks good. And um, I will mention, too, that I got finally in the mail. I've been waiting for quite a while now. I showed you guys this before, but now I actually have in hand not only the sleeves, but also the discs for the next two TPOS releases. G.G. Allen and the Scum Hoods, Suicide Rehearsals, and Mad Brother Ward Anthology Volume 1. We got the packaging, we got the discs, I got the indelible ink, and I've been stamping these things like mad. Each one is a limited edition of 100. 100 of the first edition. It's going to be on CD and cassette for both. And um, I'm looking at a probably mid to late January release date on these two. So don't go bum rushing anybody. It's going to happen. And you heard it here first. All right. And the last little bit of plugging I'm going to do before we get into my incredible internet audio exhumations. which I drink my jug of Danbury tap to, is the fact that Stephen Young has just said Discogs with a question mark? Yes. Those will be available on Discogs. And not only that, but people have been asking about my used record business. I've been listing 45s like mad on Discogs. I've got probably 2,000 or so quality 45s that I need to list on Discogs. And I've been doing that like nuts for the past few days. So I got a whole bunch of these things up. This box is primarily um, early 80s UK power pop and stuff like that. I've got more jam 45s than I can shake a snake at. Um, you know, really cool, arcane, and interesting stuff like this. All from one collection. And if you Soft Boys fans out there, you should know this name. The great unsung hero of the Soft Boys, Kimberly Rue, later of Katrina and the Waves. This is UK. I don't even like to use the, the word power pop, but like jangle pop, Rickenbacker pop, but smart and with edge and volume. What is this? Oh man, a bunch of Unholy Swill stuff. So yes, for all of you people who've been asking... A lot of new stuff on Discogs, and a lot more to come, so check it out. All right. 
So I was watching uh, Jeff Clayton's weekly vlog, which is Break On Through, which airs every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hello, Jeff. <clears throat> and the topic of the internet came up, and he was going to do, um, on his next episode of Break On Through, his top 10 internet peeves, which I'm sure will be both very interesting, very entertaining, and very informative. And I, you know, I'm a, I'm sort of a happy-go-lucky dude, you know? I've always described myself as sort of like a happy-go-luff, big old happy-go-lucky goof who just hates the entire human race. You know, that's just kind of the way I roll. I'm a happy guy. And so I thought, yeah, you know, there are a lot of peevish things about the internet, but there's definitely some good things about the internet. There are good things about the internet. I mean, hey, we're right here. Tent Talks Tunes. Couldn't do it without the internet. I mean, I could have done it with cable TV, but if uh, that was the case, I would only be seen by people in the greater Danbury area. Excuse me, I would not be able to reach Wichita, Kansas, Richmond, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Vancouver, British Columbia, New Haven, Connecticut, Scandinavia, Australia, people all over the globe who watch 10 Talks Tunes. So the internet is good for that. Definitely good for that. It's also good for, you know, a guy like me who has certain interests, and I mentioned earlier about uh, my love for taping radio broadcasts and live concerts and stuff like that. The internet has dropped a few things in my lap that have blown my mind. And today on Tent Talks Tunes, we're going to talk about some of them. Incredible internet audio exhumations. For a dude like myself, who's been collecting live tapes and things since about 19... Oh, God. 1978, actually. God, 1978. That's when I bought my first ever... Rolling Stones underground live LP, a, a really cheap knockoff of Liver Than You'll Ever Be. And I devoted an entire episode of that to Tent Talks Tunes, which is, of course, archived on my YouTube channel, which you need to subscribe to. So we're talking about 44 years now of collecting live shows and recording live bands. And, you know, you, every once in a while you sort of get to this point where you think you've seen it all and heard it all and you think you know what there is to know about a certain subject, especially, for example, a band that you're very passionate about and a band that you love a lot, you think you've got it. You think you got it all. But core blimey, because of this vexation, this troublesome thing we call the internet, I have had my eyes opened and my ears peeled to some sounds that I, I never even conceived of existing, let alone thinking that I would ever get to hear them, let alone thinking that I, the old-fashioned dude that I am, could play them back on whatever platform they're on, hit the record button on my computerized device, and burn them onto, not a cassette or a reel, but a compact disc. Physical media, kids. I want something that I can pop into the player and listen to. I want to be able to play these things in my car. You know, I had to buy another vehicle recently, and this one's a 2013 Dodge Caravan with a CD player in it. No Bluetooth, no satellite, no whatever it is you newfangled kids listen to. Its giant technological advance is the fact that it can play a compact disc. So... I gotta have these things, kids. I gotta have them. I need them. I want them. And when I learned of some of these recordings that I had never even conceived of until they popped up mysteriously on the internet, I lost track of where that sentence was going, but you know what I mean. So here's one that um, truly fried my brain. And you people know. You know about my morbid lifetime obsession, devotion, if you will, to the band Devo, D-E-V-O, from Ohio. 
my number one favorite band of all time. And that's that. So imagine my surprise, my delight, my almost heart attack inducing thrill when Bob Lewis, a man who I am quite honored and proud to say I am friendly with, Bob Lewis, co-founder of Devo, and a man who co-created the very concept of Devo. It was him and Jerry Casali. They were the ones who invented Devo. I could not believe it when I logged on one day and Bob Lewis posted, Hey, everybody, I just found a, a, a cassette recording of the second ever Devo performance from 1974, and I have uploaded it onto YouTube. Now, for a serious fan of any band, doesn't matter who you like. I mean, maybe you love Prince. Maybe you love uh, Huey Lewis in the News. You know, it doesn't matter. If you're fiendish about a band and you really, really, really want to hear everything and you're fascinated by their history and their creation, you want to hear stuff like this. I mean, imagine you're the world's biggest Huey Lewis in the News fan. And you've dissected their career with a pair of tweezers and a microscope. And a founding member of the band posts their second ever performance. And you never even knew it existed. Well, that was my reaction. I mean, however you're reacting, that was my reaction. Heart attack, stroke, apoplexy, uh, bleeding ulcers, you know, whatever it is, however you react when you learn of something like this and the fact that it's right there at your fingertips. So yes, thank you, Bob Lewis, for posting Devo's second ever performance at the Kent State University Creative Arts Festival, April 23rd, 1974. Extremely doubtful that anybody ever would have heard of this if it weren't for the ability to put something on the internet. You can go onto YouTube right now and Give it a listen. It exists. And I'll just reiterate, as, as, as a super avid collector of Devo ephemera and live recordings and unreleased stuff, I never even knew there was such a thing. Never even heard the slightest whisper of such a thing until it popped up on the internet one day. So the internet's not so bad for that one thing alone. For that one thing alone, just because of that, just for that, Let's take our respective vessels. And you know, this is my jug of Danbury tap. And drink a toast to at least one good thing on the internet. Just one. Now, here's something else you folks might not know, but I. Malcolm Tent went to go see The Grateful Dead once. Yep, sure did. Went to go see The Grateful Dead. Now, I gotta tell you, The Grateful Dead are not my favorite band in the world. I'm not a hater. I don't hate The Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead actually have kind of a fond spot in my makeup because um, when I had my brick and mortar record store, Trash American Style, the virtual version of which is on Discogs, Bandcamp, and eBay. i got to mention that periodically. I don't want you people to forget. But we had our brick and mortar record store. It's kind of ironic and kind of really, really cool that for a long time, our two biggest customer bases were the Straight Edge Hardcore Kids and the Deadheads. I mean, they, those were like the two big dominant cultural forces in the late 80s going into the early 90s, and they coexisted side by side. And we catered to the deadheads. We sold tie-dyes and incense and beaded jewelry and Guatemalan clothing and like all, all the stuff that the deadheads loved, and which I love myself, while carrying all the latest demos, albums, and releases from Revelation Records and all the other bands and Straight Edge, stuff like that. We were, re we were able to serve two audiences at once at the exact same time, and I loved it. I really, really dug it. And I really enjoyed the Grateful Dead's culture. The people who followed them were 
almost invariably really nice people. And whenever the dead were passing through Western Connecticut on tour, they, you know, of course, had the people who followed them around. And, you know, a lot of them would stop by the store. So we could always count on this big influx of visitors during touring season. And it was just always fun. It was like this traveling carnival, kind of. And so in 1991, my business partner and I, Kathy, because she was big into the dead. She loved the Grateful Dead. Kathy's sister was like sort of our gateway into the Grateful Dead. Her sister was a genuine, bona fide, bona fide deadhead. Still is. Maureen, if you're out there, hello. She was the one who opened our eyes to the Grateful Dead. And um, so, of course, she would, you know, her sister, Maureen, would go to the shows all the time. And Kathy would follow them around on tour. And finally, in 1991, I took one day off from the store to go see the Grateful Dead at Madison Square Garden. My birthday, September 23rd, 1991. God, that wasn't too long ago, was it? You know, 31, 32 years, whatever. <clears throat> the only time I ever saw the dead. And as I've mentioned before, I record every single show that I go to. There have been some exceptions. I remember not recording the dead that night because, you know, the dead's whole thing was allowing people to tape their shows and they have taper sections and... I knew there was going to be a flood of recordings of that show. So I didn't really, I didn't have to worry about it. I could just sit back and enjoy the gig, <clears throat> which I did. And then for the better part of 30 years, I never once came across a tape of that show. And if you look at my archive, which is off camera to my left, I got boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of tapes and CDs and a lot of Grateful Dead shows. But not that one. Not that one. I've got other recordings from that run from Madison Square Garden in September of 91. But I could never find the one from my birthday, 1991. And it wasn't like I, you know, had to, but I wanted it. And so, hey, 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 big surprise on the internet. There's this really cool website called archive.org, which is it's a very low key website. It's not commercial, it's a total nonprofit sort of public service. And it, you know, as you can guess by the name, archive.org, people archive things there. Everything from print media to books to old TV shows to, you guessed it, live recordings. And I was poking around on archive.org one night. I forget what I was looking for. I was looking for like old um, uh, Cold War era public service films, like Duck and Cover, the things they would show in schools warning about, you know, how to deal with nuclear fallout. I was looking for that kind of stuff. And I somehow came across the Grateful Dead section of archive.org, which was massive. They got tons and tons and tons of Grateful Dead recordings on there uh, because the Grateful Dead were all about free use. And I was like, you know, I wonder, September 23rd, 1991, do they, would they, could they, have they? Type it in, boom. There's something like seven or eight different recordings of the show I was at. Caramba! Cowabunga! After the better part of 30 years of looking, there's six or seven or eight different recordings right there at my fingertips. And, you know, you can sample each one of them. So I, you know, played little snippets of each and found all, like, wildly varying sound quality. And I got to uh, a soundboard recording, a mint stereo soundboard recording of that gig which was really good, but then I found an even better one, and I actually just dropped, oh, excuse me for one second, I gotta pick up my mess here. I found another one that was even better. It was the soundboard recording that was mixed with a really good audience recording. So, as good as the soundboard recording was, it was very dry, it didn't have any ambience to it. 
It was just every mic, you know, every mic on stage, every instrument on stage fed directly into the board, professionally mixed and beautifully balanced, but very dry. And of course, audience recordings are the opposite. You get a lot of ambience, but you don't get the clarity of the instruments. So somebody mixed the two, came up with their own version, posted it, and voila, one click of the mouse, and I got my own double CD of The Grateful Dead playing live on my birthday in 1991. And it sounds fantastic. I mean, it, sonically, it is an absolute treat to the ears. And listening to it back for the first time after, you know, waiting so long to hear it, I realized it was a pretty good show. It wasn't, wasn't like, you know, groundbreaking or earth shattering. It's not, you know, it was, it's regarded from what I can see as not, like the best run they ever did, but good. A good average run of shows by the Grateful Dead. And I was there, and now, thanks to the internet, I've got it on double CD. I will mention too, because it's my job to mention things like that, that I've been doing a similar project with a set of recordings from the devotional Devo fan gathering. Now, earlier this year, we released at the devotional a CD called Devoted. And once again, it's on my label, TPOS. And because of this, I can honestly say I have three, count them, one, two, three members of Devo on one release on my label. Pretty damn cool. Well, we're working on a vinyl version of this which will be for distribution only at 2023's Devotional Fan Gathering. And I've been doing the same thing. I've been taking the raw soundboard feed and mixing it with various audience recordings in order, in order to get the best sounding audio image. And my pal Prehistoric John from North Carolina recently sent me his mix of the soundboard tape, and it sounds très bien. Mas bueno. And so I'll be mixing that with other elements to get something that will be vinyl worthy, I think. So if you need an incentive to go to the devotional fan gathering in 2023, maybe that's a little bit. And if nothing else, it keeps me busy and keeps me off the streets. And out of trouble, I'll drink some Danbury tap to that. Danbury tap goes down smooth. <clears throat> now, I might not be completely gaga over the Grateful Dead, but I am completely gaga over Joy Division. Joy Division, and thus by extension, the early New Order. Love them both. And like many, many bands who I really love, I've jumped deep, deep, deep into the pool of Joy Division, trying to track down every single live recording there is because they were a ferocious live band. I think in a lot of ways, some of these live recordings blow away their albums. The first album especially. I know that Unknown Pleasures is one of those iconic genre defining yak 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 you know everybody in the universe has their unknown pleasures t-shirt i get it it's definitely a good album but i think that its production takes away a lot of the power of the music you know the production is ice cold and frigid and <clears throat> in its own way very sparse so it's got a definite feel to it and it definitely works but I don't think it's representative of the way the band actually sounded live, which was powerful, like really powerful. And that's why you need to have the live recordings. That's why this stuff is so crucial to have out there. If you really want to understand a band, and excuse me, if you really want to get what a band is all about, you need to hear all of this stuff. Kyle is tuned in. Hello, Kyle. Kyle, do you dig what I'm saying? Can you smell what I'm cooking? You gotta have it all. So, 
yeah, spent years and years and years starting with scratchy old poorly pressed bootleg LPs and then graduating to cassettes. And now, of course, we got the internet. And I found a lot of live Joy Division material on the internet. And, um, been, you know, checking it all out, and a lot of it's really cool, and I've heard some really, really good stuff that I, as usual, did not know existed, and that I've added to my collection, but the one that really, really cooked my goose was this one right here, and I need to, uh, I see a message from Ray Gelman has come through saying she needs my PayPal email. Well, guess what? I'm going to tell Ms. Gelman and everybody else my PayPal address is mt at malcolmtent.net. mt at malcolmtent.net. Just so you people know, you might need that information at some point. I just gave it to you. Ms. Gelman, I just gave it to you. So I'm going to reach over to the monitor here so you guys can look at my forehead real up close and personal and click off. And I got a question here. Eric Johnson wants to know if I know the dates for the 2023 devotional. Not sure yet. Not sure. I believe it's mid-September, I think. But you know what? If you guys don't mind looking at my forehead again, I'm going to reach over here and grab my calendar, my paper calendar. This is a real good view of my hairline, such as it is. But... My paper calendar. I have this sort of vague memory that I was delighted that the devotional dates do not conflict with the anti-scene 40th anniversary. No, I don't have it written down. But Eric and anybody else who's interested, I, I want to say mid-September-ish. Definitely keep an eye on my internet presence for updates on that. So anyway... Of all the great Joy Division material that has surfaced on the internet, the one that really boiled my chicken was something that I just could not have conceived of existing. An actual recording of Warsaw, which is the band before... And they, it was still, still the same lineup, but before they were called Joy Division, they were called Warsaw. And they started out as a, you know, 1977 UK punk band. And apparently, you know, toured a lot, played everywhere, but there's never any evidence. There's, there's precious little live evidence, even on the internet, of Joy Division, Warsaw, what have you, before early 1979. The earliest decent-sounding Joy Division live tape is, I believe, from February of 1979, maybe March. But there's, like, nothing before that. Like, zero. And there never has been. And I've been a Joy Division fan since about 19, you know, 80, 81. And then out of nowhere, this turned up on some file sharing site. And not only is it a complete live recording of Warsaw, but it's off the soundboard. Pretty decent quality. And it's got unreleased songs. It's like everything you possibly want when you're a collector of this kind of stuff. A band you love, a recording you never dreamed existed, with songs you never heard before, and it's quite listenable. And it really blows my mind, because the recording date on this is September 14th, 1977, from a venue called The Rock Garden in Middlesbrough, England. And out of all, in all the years I've been collecting this stuff... I've never once ever seen or heard of a tape from this venue. You know, normally a lot of venues will be the origin point for a lot of live recordings. Um, for example, City Gardens in Trenton. Millions of live recordings from the City Gardens. Billions of recordings from the Anthrax in Norwalk. Tons of recordings from the Empty Bottle in Chicago you know, Bottom of the Hill in San Francisco. These are all names that you see over and over and over again when you collect live tapes. But the Rock Garden in Middleborough, England? Never. Never once. So, it's all that stuff. A band I love, 
in an early undocumented phase of their career from a venue that no one's ever heard of in a decent recording with unreleased songs. And it came out of nowhere. Showed up on the internet. Cry, cry. It's enough to make you not want to cancel your internet service. And it just blows my mind. It's like, how does this kind of thing even exist? Like, who would have even thought of taping a completely, absolutely unknown band out of thousands of punk rock bands in the summer-ish of 77, why would anybody have taken these guys in that town at that venue? Why? Who knows? But somebody did, and it took, you know, whatever, 45 years or so for it to finally surface. I just love the mysteries of these kinds of things. I really, really do. In a lot of ways, I don't even want to know the answers. I like the mystery. So I'm kind of glad that we have this and that it happened the way it did. Super cool. You could ask the same question about another completely unknown, at the time, perhaps generic, punk rock band in 1977. This band, according to all the information I know about this recording, about everything I know about this recording, this was their third ever concert. They were the opening band for another obscure semi, demi, hemi punk rock band. They only had a seven song set. They played for 23 minutes. And for completely unknown reasons, imponderable, unfathomable, unfathomable reasons, somebody in the audience had a tape recorder and press the record button when this absolutely unknown, nobody, go nowhere band played their third ever concert and then sat on it for kind of the same deal, 44, 45 years or so. And then it mysteriously appeared on the internet. And a dude like myself, who's a fiend for this band, was double delighted to hear for the first time ever this recording of The Police. The Police's third ever concert from 1977 in a pretty darn good sounding audience recording. Original lineup, Sting, Stewart, and Henri. And after wondering about what the original lineup sounded like live for a large part of my life, I finally got to hear it. And it's pretty good. It's, it's, it's not terrible at all. Like Henri got a lot of stick for not being a very good guitar player. Which is, of course, why Andy Summers got into the band, because he was a phenomenal guitar player. Henri, not a bad guitar player. Not at all. I think his problem was that Sting and Stewart were definitely like, you know, world-class, phenomenal musicians, and Henri was good. And that's kind of revealed during this set. It's certainly not bad by any stretch of the imagination, but you can tell that there's a certain spark in the rhythm section that's lacking in the guitar parts. Uh, but, it, you know, it's one of those things where there's just hints, just the slightest hints <clears throat> of things to come. Like Sting has already got the charisma. He's got the stage banter. He's got the ability to talk to an audience. Obviously, phenomenal musician, Stewart, banging out the drums. They're just the slightest, slightest hints. It doesn't sound like the police that we know and love, but there are just little faint traces of what was to come. And a lot of that is actually revealed on a tape from five months later when they played the Mont de, Mar Mont de Marsan Punk Rock Festival, which has not only Henri, but also Andy Summers one of just a few gigs they ever played as a four-piece. And the growth and development of the band from March to August is 
boy, it's noticeable. It is really noticeable. And you can also really, really tell the difference between what Henri could play and what Andy Summers could play. When you hear this recording with the both of them on stage, forget it. You, you understand all of a sudden why Henri just had to go. It's really something. And yeah, this show from the, the National Rooms has got one, two, three, four unreleased songs out of eight. And it's the only recording I know of with, um, let's see, Fallout's on it. Nope, sorry, this one's got nothing achieving, but this one doesn't. Anyway, if you love The Police, this is a critical piece of their history. Doesn't sound like them, but if you want to know it all, then you got to have this one. Grant Den, my former bandmate from, from uh, Florida. I'll, I'll read you the set list, Grant. It's got Landlord. Kids to Blame, Clown's Revenge, Another Night in the Grand Hotel, It's My Life, Dead End Job, and Fallout. Grant, you want it? It's yours. It's on the internet. Go grab it. Now, here is a real labor of love. Oh, boy. I gotta drink some more. My throat's starting to give out. I've, I've, I've found that my natural limit for these kinds of things is about an hour. I can do tent talks to for about an hour. I can talk on the phone for about an hour. Typically an hour is all I got before I start to get kind of raw and gross feeling. But I definitely want to address this one. You know, being the collector that I am and being the fanboy fiend that I am, you can imagine what it's like for me to try to get the complete, complete set of recordings by Terry Knight and the pack. Excuse me, Terry Knight and the pack, yes. The fact that I gotta have them all. Now you might ask, Terry Knight and the pack? Who dat? I'll tell you. In a very, very simple nutshell, before there was Grand Funk Railroad, there was Terry Knight and the Pack. It was a garage band, basically, from Flint, Michigan, consisting of Terry Knight, and at various times, Mark Farner, Don Brewer, Craig Frost, and then a bass player named Herm Jackson, and a few rotating guitarists. It's basically everybody from Grand Funk including their manager, except for Mel Shocker, the bass player. Mel had nothing to do with the pack. He came later. But the pack were a very prolific band from 1965 up to about 1969. And they released tons of singles. They had two full-length albums. Um, there's one double album compilation that's got a couple of unreleased songs on it. They cranked out a lot of shiznit. And almost all of them are readily available. The only exceptions being their first two singles. Their first two singles are really hard to find. And I was able to score a copy of the first one, which is called Tears Come Fallen. The second one, called How Much More, I can't find one. I cannot find one anywhere at an affordable price. And I think the reason being that it's, I would say, by far the best record that Terry Knight and the Pack ever made. Most Terry Knight in the Pack records, I'm going to go on record right now and saying they're really not that good. They're really not. I mean, they, Terry Knight had this genius, and I'm going to, again, draw your attention to my YouTube channel. I did an entire episode of Tent Talks Tunes on Terry Knight. Fascinating story. Fascinating. But I'll just say for the purposes of things here and now that Terry Knight was an incredible song stylist. He could take whatever was the latest hit single and make a sound alike with no effort whatsoever. And, you know, they, they were usually, you know, they're not great songs, obviously, but man, he could actually nail the essence of a particular sound. He could do something in the style of the Yardbirds or in the style of... Um, the left bank. You know what I mean? The style of the Beatles. He was uncanny with that. 
But their second single called How Much More is actually a really good, savage Yardbirds pastiche. And I think that's why it goes for a lot of money because it's it's actually not cheesy. It's like a, a really good record that stands on its own. And so for years and years and years, I've been trying to put together my own compilation of all the Terry Knight in the Pack stuff. All the singles, both the albums, the loose compilation tracks, the gray area releases, all of it. And I could never do it because I lacked that second single. Because I ain't paying 150 bucks for it. I'm just not. And for years and years and years, I resisted because I'm a purist and I wanted it on vinyl. And I finally said, you know what? Screw it. Somebody has got to put it on damn YouTube. And yeah, sure enough, someone did put it on YouTube. So I played it on YouTube, recorded it. And after many, many years of trying, was able to actually create my own custom-made double CD compilation of the complete Terry Knight and or the pack. And the irony is I'm probably never going to listen to it because, as I mentioned before, most of their music is not that great. But I had to do it. I had to do it. And because of the internet, I was finally able to. So thank you, internet. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Internet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Knight in the pack. Who would have ever thought... Who would have ever thought? Not me. When I was a young lad asking for blank tapes for Christmas, all this stuff was in con see the bull. Utterly. So, yeah, the internet's a pain in the butt, but I'm glad we got it. And I'm glad I got you guys, my frantic fans, my loyal listeners, my, my vivacious viewers, my friends, casual acquaintances, all of you guys. Thank you for tuning in as I close in on, my gosh, almost three years of doing Tent Talks Tunes. This is my last episode of 2023, and it's been, that's 2022, it's been a lot of fun real good year for touring and rocking and talking to everybody and doing mail order versus, you know, via my various platforms, the Discogs and the Bandcamp and even the eBay. Thank you all for making it happen. And I really do hope to see as many of you as we possibly can. As I plunge headlong into 2023, I want to play as many shows as I can, both as a, as a solo with Ultra Bunny, with Anti Scene, maybe with They Hate Us or the Bloody Apostles, who knows? And if I can't see you guys in person, then I do look forward to seeing you again on Tent Talks Tunes. And hopefully that'll be in about 167 hours. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.